So this basically makes a triangular ass where you can fill um, slowly with an incremental knob over, over um, you know, order one charge per, per site. All right, so now how do we actually study this? So our, our tool of study is uh, scanning a single electron transistor. So we bring, we have this heterostructure um, with this system we're studying, and we bring our single electron transistor tip nearby. And the, basically what we measure is the electric fields um, from this metallic backache up through the sample and how much of that is picked up by that SET. Um, the single electron transistor is a very good set, sensor of potential, so if there's an electric field, you will, you will measure it. And the basic idea is that if the system in between is gapped or insulating, all the electric field will pass right through it. If the um, sample in between is metallic, then it will screen out all the electric field and you'll measure nothing. Um, that's at least a qualitative picture, but quantitatively, how much electric field gets through tells you a particular quantity uh, called the inverse electronic progressibility, um, schematically shown here, I guess, GDN. And if you reintegrate this, you can get out the chemical potential of mu of n. So um, if the median is big, you're in a gap state, and you're, we call that incompressible. If the median is small, then you have a high density of states, um, and you're just sort of filling some electronic band. So we look at two samples through this technique, both between like two and, and four degrees. Um, and the main feature uh, in our experimental data, which looks like this, is uh, we see um, this is plotting uh, the inverse electronic compressibility, DMDN, as a function of um, holes per Mori unit cells, so the number of holes per size of uh, the Mori lattice. And mu plus minus one, we see a very big gap, um, peak in DMDN. And mu plus minus one third, we also stabilize an insulator that's sort of very weak at the noise floor of the measurement at zero field. And if we apply a little magnetic field, it gets much, much more obvious. All right, so now we can look at the magnetic field dependence. We can sweep the magnetic field up from 0 to 11 Tesla and see how these gaps behave. And we can see, even from looking at the compressibility, the so yellow here is a gap state, while blue and cyan are, are, are metallic. So I see that these gaps sort of persist up to high magnetic fields. And if we integrate this um, data, we can plot what the charge gap is um, in sort of electron holes. Um, as a function of magnetic field. So in both devices, we see a gap at equal plus minus one that grows sort of linearly in magnetic field um, up to our highest field ring. And in equal minus one third, we also see a gap that grows at low magnetic fields, but then it sort of flattens out or decreases slowly at around seven Tesla. And uh, this is sort of schematic what we think these gaps look like. So at new plus minus one, you just have one spin for one sort of whole per more unit cell. Um, and you have minus one third, you have a similar triangular lattice, but it's just one out of every three sites. And because um, the exchange coupling in this system is very, very small compared to the field scale, um, and pretty low magnetic fields in terms of the experience, the spin should also polarize out of the plane with sort of aligning with the magnetic field. So at equal zero, you probably expect some sort of like non trivial magnetic magnetism, but in a very small magnetic field, all the spins polarize. And um, I guess the curious point that we want to understand is why this gap changes at around seven Tesla. Um, and to understand that, we need to think about what the excitations are on either sort of side of the gap as we add or remove charge, because um, the gap size is basically going to be determined by the energy dependence of the excitations on either side. And if they, get, um, if they go up or go down, it will change you know, whether the gap size increases or decreases. So first, we'll think about what the excitation is at higher hole density, and we sort of thought about two different possibilities here. One is the sort of cartoon in black here, um, which is basically just you add a hole that's also sort of spin aligned at an interstitial site. Um, this is sort of the most trivial thing you can do. You have a magnetic field on a plane, you add a hole in, and, and it has the same the same spin as everything else. Um, Another option is that you add a spin pointing the other direction, which might be favorable at low fields because there's some sort of antiferromagnetism in the system, um, and the exchange gain uh, is sort of you gain from that at low magnetic fields. Um, we think this is not theoretically not what's actually happening, um, 
And the reason is that the exchange coupling should be really small, theoretically. Um, and also experimentally, it sort of looks like sort of more on this at the moment. Experimentally, this doesn't really seem consistent with the data that we measure. Um, on the other side of the gap, which is removing a hole, um, one possible option is that you create a spin polar on excitation. So in addition to just removing a hole from this sort of background of spin polarized holes, you also want to flip a single spin, and this you get some binding energy from connecting this absence of a hole with a flip spin, um, and then this can move around in in the system and it creates sort of this itinerant and three half of particle. This has been predicted by a bunch of theory um, on spin polarized triangular hover model, where basically because of the frustration of the triangular lattice, this becomes a favorable excitation. Um, but this is a spin three halves, so as you go to higher magnetic fields, um, this will eventually become unfavorable relative to just removing a hole. So this gives you some sort of change in the, how the excitation behaves as a function of magnetic field, and we think could explain our gap size. So the last thing I'll talk about is how we actually, you know, I've shown them all. these are a bunch of cartoons, but how we actually distinguish between these options from experimental data. So in addition to looking at sort of the size of the gap in the chemical potential, we can also look at what the value of the chemical potential is um, both above and below the gap, so mu minus and mu plus. And if we track that in our data, what we see is that if we look at mu plus or the you know, the chemical potential to lower a hole, um, or sort of the chemical potential to remove a hole, we see that there's a very sharp change in that behavior right around 7 Tesla and new equals minus one third, where we see the gap change. But it, the other side, where we're just adding extra hole, it's sort of completely smooth throughout the experimental range. So we think this is consistent with the picture where we create some polarons sort of below 7 Tesla at a lower hole density, and then at higher hole density, we just remove a hole, and um, or sorry, at higher field, we just remove a hole, and at higher hole density, we just have this unchanging adding, adding an extra spin. All right, so that's pretty much uh, my talk. Just as a quick review, we talked a little bit about um, creating more super lattices out of semi conductive transitional cognitives and studying them with a single electron transistor, and then um, the insulating states we see and, and the spin polar excitations to those, to those states. So uh, I'd like to thank my collaborators, particularly Jack and you, um, also in Ben Feldman's group, as well as uh, Frida Devagul, uh, and now Bruce's group at MIT, who did like, all the theory stuff. Thanks. I think we don't take questions in the student talk, so we'll move on to our uh, next uh, Okay, uh, we have our first uh, postdoc speaker of today. Uh, we have uh, Christian Heiden from uh, the Stanford Pulse Institute. Uh, he's a joint postdoc with uh, Professor Reese and uh, Professor Tony Hines. Uh, he did his PhD from uh, FAU in Germany and then he's now here at Stanford. So, without further ado, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'm very excited to talk today about a recent hot topic in condensed matter data physics, so called lightweight electronics. So, the light field oscillates between 1 million times faster than our current transistors. It would be wonderful if you can use a light field, for example, to steer electrons 
inside of a solid or inside of a kind of nanostructure at optical frequencies. And it will be automatic because it's so precise and fast that the electron remains fully quantum mechanical. In that case, you can, for example, drive the electron with a light field through a material and grow, for example, quantum properties. And this opens up the field of light field driven quantum electronic, which I will talk today about. And it is this will become very handy because we know already that our signal technology has been limited and is not following Moore's law anymore. And part of the reason is because actually the clock rate has been limited to a few gigahertz because of excessive heating inside of, for example, the transistor. So I have to show you how desperate the computer industry or data industry is looking for solution is, for example, shown as this picture. I like it because it shows that, for example, Microsoft put data centers into the ocean just to cool the data racks. So this somehow shows how desperate we are looking for new solutions. And one of the solutions is uh, what we have been up for the last 10 years is silicon photonics. So instead of using electrons, which flows, for example, to a circuit, we want to use photons. This has had a lot of advantages. And let me actually compare the difference between photonic and electronic versus this slide. So you see electronics here, we're working with gigahertz frequencies. We are going soon maybe to the terahertz. And we have on the other side photonics, which deals with photons or light, which operate at terahertz frequencies. However, if you look how it actually works, they are quite different. In electronics, we have actually a field which allows it to switch, for example, a transistor. We have a PN junction, we have rectifier. So these are field driven processes. However, if you go to photonics, usually as a name for that, we deal with photons. So photons itself is a kind of what we call a perturbative light matter interaction. But usually we see it in photonics, we don't see the electric field of light interacting with the system. And since all the becomes uh, now to the field, what I would like to work on is kind of combining electronics and photonics by um, developing lightly driven electronics. And how this works is actually, you can think about the following. We have a light field, and the light field oscillates depending on the frequency at around 2.7 times a second. So this is, for example, one of the cycle of 800 nanometer. You see all that intensity, envelope or kind of envelope, which defines the pulse duration. So now if you send such a laser pulse to a diode, everything you usually measure is actually proportional to the intensity envelope. So in other words, proportional to the number of photons per time. So we don't see this fast oscillating electric field usually in measurement. And the reason is simply because the light band interaction, as you can see here in this picture with the weighted band protection band, is described by photon absorption. And the photon absorption of current depends how much photon we have for laser pulse, this governs in principle this curve. So now to overcome this problem, we can use very intense and strong laser field. If you use very strong and intensity field, this is simple photon-based absorption picture breaks down. Now what's actually happening is you can understand this equation here. So in here you see K, so K is a print reverse the electron is in the band structure. And this is a proportional to the electric field. So if you apply a very strong electric field, you can improve and print momentum from the light field to the electron and move the electron to the band structure. If the light field is very strong, actually, you can move the electron into the entire photon zone, for example. And this actually means within a fraction of an optical cycle, within around two to three times a second, we can drive the electron from one side of, for example, a band circuit to the other side. And we do this so fast that you can even see that part of the wave function, part of the electron, can go to the conduction band, whereas the other part is the valence band. And we do this so fast that the quantum mechanical nature of the electron is preserved. And we treat the electron as a quantum matter, which is split into um, quantum states, state in the convection band or wave instrument. And this is possible because we do it fast. So you see here, for example, the time axis here, and you have different processes, you know, you have electron photon scattering and solid electron scattering. And kind of we do this driving faster than all the processes. So this allows us to drive the electron fully coherent inside of a band structure. And um, this opened up this kind of quantum trajectory control on a time scale faster than scatterings. And with this, we can actually build novel tools. We can build lightweight quantum electronics, which I will show you in a second. And we can also do coherent spectroscopy because we can drive the electrons. If we could measure the phase of the electrons, we can actually probe some quantum properties of a solid. 
So since opened up um, quite some fields and, and I've worked on, on different parts here, I will today mainly focus about, I will show you so that you can build an electron interferometer inside of a solid. This interferometer is cool because if you want to grow, for example, the weight character of an electron or the weight property, building an interferometer is a way to go. The second part I will talk about is about the role of coherence. Let me start with the first one here. Um, before I go into detail in this one, I would like to show you what kind of fields or laser do we need. Are there really crazy big laser systems, or can we also have a small laser source? So usually when you talk about like, actually you're probably familiar with this system. So they have resonant absorption, we have photomates absorption, we have linear nonlinear optics, and this may be one photon absorption, two photon absorption, but maybe it's described by the such equation here. You see here a uh, kind of property of the material which has I1, I2, I3, and you have some nonlinear interaction. So this is where most textbooks all the stops. But if you make a light piece sterner here, you can also get non-resonant absorption and inter interband motion. So simply we drive the electron into band structure. And you can simply distinguish these two parts by this um, simple parameter. So you compare what kind of energy does the electron gain when we drive it into band structure. We call it under of energy. And you compare it with the photon energy. If you drive the electrons quite significantly into the band structure, then the quantum of energy is large and should be in the strong field regime. In the other case, we call it non uh, kind of either perturbative optics or um, kind of nonlinear optics. And I can give you some estimates here. For example, it depends on both of the material, on the wavelength, and the field strength, but usually you need to have a concern of one volt per nanometer. This is what you would like to have to drive the electrons into the band structure. So if you have a laser which is so strong to have, for example, one volt per nanometer, most material can damage. So what we need to do is we compress these pulses to a few optical cycles. In this case, we can still maintain this high field strength, but actually reduce the power of the laser or the energy we put into the system quite significantly. Additionally, when we have such a short laser pulse, we can again uh, define the envelope, the pulse duration, we have a carrier frequency and some other freedom. And so this is called carrier envelope phase. And in the lab, we can control the carrier envelope phase. So you can see if it moves, it changes, in other words, the symmetry of the laser pulse. This we can do actually in a high precision. Actually, on eight half a second is the precision we have. So we can, for example, fix this peak here with a precision of eight half a second. And this became possible by using, for example, frequency pump technology. So now in the measurement, what we do is we, we start with graphene. We heard already in the talk before how amazing 2D materials are. So here we use just graphene because a conducting material, we have it on top of a transparent material, and we have two gold electrodes, which allows us to measure the of current. So we have the data pulse, we can control the waveform, and we would like to measure if the current we detected the electrode is sent to the waveform. So we put it all in a vacuum chamber so to give you a small picture that's on top of a chip and we have a lot of these structures and we can connect them to wires and measure some current. So this is how, for example, such a measurement looks like. We modulate the waveform by, for example, changing the current envelope phase and we pick up the current which is sent to the waveform modulation. Here you see we increase the field strength and we measure the current. What you can see here is already quite unusual. So we increase our field strength, makes our power higher, higher, higher oscillator. First, it's negative, and around two or three nanometers, it's getting positive. If you go even higher, we see that the current oscillates as a function of field strength. And I will show you in the next slide, it's actually the reason we, because we built here already a kind of interferometer with the electrons. So let me explain this how it works. So in a sense, it's probably good we look first to the fine structure of graphene. So graphene has uh, such a band structure that come from a high finding model. You have the valence band, production band, and you have six so-called K points. And if you zoom in, you have the famous linear energy dispersion relation of graphene. But we'll focus now on this complex structure to visualize what's going on inside of graphene. So we have this bond. We know this equation. So we apply a field and drive the electron the band structure. The first thing is what we can think about it. We drive an electron through the direct point. Of course, what's happening is the coupling at the drug point is very strong. The electron undergoes the transition from the valence band to the conduction band and oscillates in principle back and forth. This is what's happening with the laser pulse. We can also go to this electron here, sitting here. So here, actually, this electron sees a rather big apparent band gap and rather undergo the adiabatic motion, intraband motion only. Now it's getting interesting where both can happen. 
So here you see a mixture of intra-bank motion and inter-bank transition. And there is actually the point where we will learn the parameter. Let me explain this to you here. So here you see again this complex structure, you see the this electron here. So what the electron sees as a function of time is something like this. So this is an instantaneous eigen energy of the electron when you drive it in the band structure. And you see here where the electron is driven at the point where the coupling between the two bands is strong. It can be the wave function can be split. Part of the wave function goes to the convection band, the other goes to the valence band. And within one optical cycle, so within 2.7 femtoseconds, these wave functions can meet again and interfere. And interference can be constructed or destructed. So this concept might now sound very abstract, but it's actually nothing else like a microcentric parameter. We have a coherent light source, we have beam splitters, and depending on the pass lengths and principle of phase difference, you can get actually a constructive or destructive interference. So now in the solid, it's very similar. However, here we deal with quantum phase. Uh, in this phases, you can understand like the following. So in principle, when you drive an electron adiabatically in the band structure, the amplitude is mainly fixed. So this tells you where the electron is and which band. And here's the space factor. And the space factor in the solid can look like this, or it's called dynamical phase, which in principle is a proportional or related to the energy difference between the two states. And also some fancy parameter like very curvature or geometric phase or topological phase. So this is currently encoded as a screen area. So now if we actually can measure some interference, it allows us to actually measure this quantum phase in a solid. And this is very interesting because usually measurements are not sensitive to it. If you do objects, if you try to absorb measurement, you don't measure the phase, you only measure where the electron is. So here we build an interferometer actually to measure this. And if you measure it makes the field strength a bit larger, you drive it further, actually the area is larger, and, and then also the interference condition. So by increasing the field strengths, we already expect that the population dynamics start to oscillate. So now let us make the term of the current. Um, in current, actually, we have to go one step further. For current, we want to have more electrons going in one direction than the other direction. This is how we define current. And this means we need a conduction by population something like this. You want to have more electrons, for example, on the left side or on your side on the right side compared to the left side of the column. So how do we get this? And in principle, there are a few cycle laser force can help because it breaks the symmetry. So here is may not sound a little bit complicated, but let's just walk through it. So you just have here the so minus one is this electron starting on this part, and this one, the plus one, is electron starting on this side. If you look only to the main optical cycle here, you see that an electron and they're going to the tunnel event here, and then longer trajectory starting from the green part compared to the starting on the right side. And this is simply because actually the few cycle laser pulse breaks symmetry. So this means that electron starting on the left side might have a different phase acquired compared to an electron starting on the right side. So the interference condition is different from electron starting on the right and left side. And this can actually result such a asymmetry in the population distribution. If we flip the carrier angle of phase, so we mirror everything, everything becomes reversed. So the measurement, if you flip the carrier angle of phase, you should inject the current in one direction or in the other direction. So now that well, everything pretty hand-weighty, so let's actually do some simulation. So graphene is very nice because the pi orbital in graphene is very strong. So you mostly enough to only consider two bands. So we use a high pi model of graphene. We also use this kind of block acceleration theory and solve the Schrodinger equation numerically and actually calculate how does the population build up in the band structure. So we'll show you how a movie how it looks like. So you see here top view of the cone. The color is the conduction of population, and you see once a laser interacts with the system, you move the electrons in the band structure and you build up some population. Yeah. After the laser pulse is done, it looks like this. So you see here resonant one photon absorption, you see two photon absorption, but most importantly, you see an asymmetric part. And this asymmetry here is the reason why we can get a current. The asymmetry can point to the right, or it can point to the left, depending on the carrier dollar phase depending on what, what we saw in the slide before. So this is actually, these electrons here are the reason why we get a current. And these are of the electron which undergoes this interferometer with around 50% transition probability. So by doing this in a full Bruno ensemble, actually, we can nicely reproduce actually our measurement. We get actually a pretty good agreement between where the current revert is assigned, which actually allows us now to understand a quantum phase in the solid. We can make it more complicated. We can now actually shape the pulses, synthesize waveform 
to drive the electron, not only back and forth, but we can make it in a complex trajectory and probe in terms of the phase of all the blue and so on. We can also look at different materials, but there's a lot of work actually which, which can be done. So now I would like to switch a bit gears and, and move away from the current and talk about spectroscopy. So if you move an electron to the band structure, you not only generate a current, but you can also get radiation. You know, if you accelerate some charge, you might get some radiation. And this is called high harmonic generation. And this is what I would like to uh, focus on in the next uh, two, three minutes. Um, so we have this amazing sample from Famio and, and um, Amy can also fabricate some here. Yeah. And, um, so we try to the laser pulse on the 2D materials and measure transmission. Uh, usually when we have a laser pulse here, we work with five micron. So the cycle duration is a bit longer, so the tens of femtoseconds, so we might already get some coherence. But in principle, we can measure transmission. If the light field is strong and like uh, um, TV samples, we have a broken version symmetry, you can get second harmonic as well. If you make the light more intense, you can get third, fourth, fifth, sixth harmonic duration. In the lab, actually, you can measure harmonic up to the 19th harmonic. And this is actually the high harmonic spectrum. But people were pretty excited about it because we were hoping, can we actually learn something about the emergency spectrum about the underlying band structure? Can we reconstruct band structure? It's actually not as easy as it turned out, but we can play a bit of it. So, for example, you can put a second layer on top. And depending how we align the second layer, we can actually control the symmetry of the material. For example, if we make a crystal that looks like this, we call it AAT stacked crystal, we have even of our harmonics because we have a broken version symmetry. If we play around, we make an ABAD example, all the even order harmonics are gone. So certainly high harmonics are sensitive to the symmetry of the material. Another property, and now I want to go a bit about coherence, is when you drive electrons in the band structure, coherence is required. So let me visualize this. So what we do is we generate electron hole pairs here and drive them to the band structure. So now the band structure might be unharmonic. This is why you might get some radiation. This is one sort of radiation, high harmonic radiation. Additionally, we generate electron hole pairs where you can think it's like a dipole. And if we drive the dipole further from the band structure, the spacing energy space becomes larger, the frequency starts to radiate becomes larger. So this means, especially these high order harmonics, as you see them here, are coming from the driven kind of electron hole pair to high energy states. And this means the further we drive from the longer the trajectory, the more harmonics we get. So can we learn something about coherence here? And what we do is we use the second laser pulse, and the second laser pulse injects additional charge carriers. If you have more carriers, usually you have more scattering. We reduce the coherence lifetime. So let's see what we see here. So the blue spectrum is when the pump is on. And what you can see here, all harmonics become reduced. But in particular, when you integrate your rate, you see that mainly it's a higher order harmonic are significantly more reduced. So this means a longer trajectories are more influenced by, by defacing, which makes sense because it takes longer to go up the band structure. So now we can model it, we know how the band structure looks like, we know how the laser pulse look like, and reconstruct the defacing time. We can do it by fitting one curve here, but we can also do it for different um, conditions and we can get this curve here. So you see this curve here is of soft fluence, or in other words, the number of carriers you have in the system and the defacing time. And you see here actually if you have a lot of carriers inside the defacing actually happening on a single time per second time scale. So this is actually a problem if you want to build up some light field and quantum electronics, you want to actually overcome the problem. So the first thing is you want to avoid any additional charge pair in the system. Ideally you work with larger band gaps or you avoid any resonant excitation. More recently, we also work with topologically protected materials. So these are materials which have kind of intrinsic higher uh, coherence lifetimes. Um, but yeah, this is where, where in principle uh, we're going. Um, I hope I could give you a kind of feeling about what we're working on. So principally, you can drive out into the current structure. We can measure interesting quantum phases by building interferometer inside of solid between radius protection bands. We can also do the same for the interfaces. So they didn't talk about it, but uh, we can ask questions like, how fast can we separate charge? How fast is the shock heat charge? How fast is the PL charge? And can we separate charge in optical frequencies? And, and this is actually a field which is all very interesting to build fast detectors, for example. And of course, new materials are always good because we need to find actually the best material to use this kind of physics. And with this, I'm already at the end of my talk, and um, as, as 
as I mentioned, I've worked with, with, with David Lees and Ptolemy and finally you, Shambu, at the Stanford side and Stack side, well, my former group in, in, in Germany, and we all have series support with Ignacio uh, Franco and then um, um, Andrew Rubio's group in, in, in Germany. This is the same group. Great. Thank you. So you mentioned the um, exploring other materials for the first half, yeah. first kind of vignette. Have you explored other materials that have, I guess, more straightforward band structures like graphene or more well known that allow you to oscillate in the same way, or is it just a lot of larger 3D semiconductors just get too complicated and you can't yeah. really do these? It's a good point. I mean, on one hand, we want to have a simple system, and graphene is, is one of the simpler systems. Um, if you go to different materials, for example, the biological protective material, then you have all state surface state, you have more bands. Then actually, we cannot, or at least I cannot do the simulation. Then we work, for example, on the Rubius group. But the problem is, um, it's very difficult to extract physics out of it. So we, we did measurements on topological protective materials. We have indications that they have a lot of thin lifetime and we see features. But it's, it's work in progress, very difficult to integrate it. But what I think is probably better to work maybe with this, um, this silicon vacancy centers in Diamond or we'll work with qubits or I mean, it doesn't need to be a really bad structure. I mean, all of the two level systems, this kind of physics works. So in two level systems, we can think about Rabi physics, but it's like this strong, you can all the bands, it's just bands and the tunneling. And I mean, there are a lot of similarities between artificially created solids and two, I mean, there's a lot of work to do. But so yeah, it works best when things are simple -ish. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. And since I think all of the way we need to go, I mean, if we start early with twisted filing, I mean, it's great that it's, it's so complex. So um, we just try to make the system as simple as possible, extract physics, and then kind of try to get it through more materials. Thank you for all the predicting. For example, business and I that took this slide out, but in principle, you have materials like this and selenite here, you have all state, surface state. And the good thing is this surface state has been polarized, has been momentum block. So you can actually suppress backscattering and you see a lot of the gems like Thank you. Yeah. So this brings me to the kind of uh, system that we want to simulate that are called the continuity system. Where here you would like to simulate the interaction between uh, the degree of freedom uh, and its environment. So it can be used, for example, to describe the physics of the Congo uh, problem, where the degree of freedom will be the spin and the bass will be your Fermi impact. Uh, but it can be also used to describe the spin boson problem and also the Bondi Sand Gordon one that I'm now going to introduce because that's the one we try to, to simulate. So uh, the bondi and uh, problem is actually a quite simple problem in terms of like uh, ingredients. Um, so you will have a quantum particle that will be trapped in a periodic potential. So because of that, you will have a first parameter that will be the height of your barrier. And so you can understand that uh, because you have a quantum particle, if you let it evolve for a long enough time, uh, this particle will be able to quantum tunnel to the other way of your potential. And so therefore, everything is happening as if uh, there will be no potential energy, because if you measure the average potential energy of this uh, particle, it will go to zero. So this is what is called, uh, I mean, this is why we describe this particle as being delocalized. And so now let's bring uh, some complexity to this problem. And uh, to do so, we make it intact with an environment. And so uh, the interaction with this uh, environment will induce some dissipation. Uh, that will be parametrized by the parameter alpha that I'm going to describe after. But what you can understand is that because it will interact with an environment, the wave function will start to localize more and more. And eventually, if the dissipation is strong enough, at some point, the particle will be completely localized in one way. So you recover something that will look more like what you would get with a classical potential. So 
these are, this is like a very sketchy uh, introduction on uh, what are the kind of physics that you could expect in this system. And it's mainly, uh, I mean, here what I'm describing is like a quantum phase condition where you have uh, two phases of matter, let's say. One will be localized and one will be delocalized. And the parameter that will control this phase function would be the dissipation strength alpha. And actually, there have been some petition uh, in the 90s that said that this should occur for a very specific value of alpha, which is equal to one. And so this is the kind of physics that we are going to try to first implement and then to probe. So this is what we want to measure. We want to measure what we call the strong polarization of the effective barrier potential and to see if we can go from the localized to the delocalized phase function. So uh, this brings me to the outline of the talk, where in the first part I will try to explain you how do we first implement this problem, and then how do we actually measure, and, I mean, are we actually able to measure this kind of polarization? So uh, let's start with the implementation. Uh, so as I said in the title, uh, we are going to use a Jason Junction array, so maybe I can do a brief introduction on what is a Jason Junction and what we we'll, uh, use them for. So in our case, we are using a superconducting, isolating superconducting junction that are made out of aluminum and its oxide. And so therefore, there is two energy scales that will uh, describe the, the dynamics of this uh, circuit. The first one will be the charging energy that will depend on the, uh, on the charge difference between the two metallic plates of your junction. And the second one is that because, you're, I mean, because these superconducting plates are actually uh, super, superconductor, uh, it means that there will be a macroscopic phase difference between these two plates. And so therefore, there will be an energy associated with it, which is the Joyson energy. And so that could be the small energy scale that you have to deal with. And so on the right, uh, it's just the circuit equivalent of this uh, Joyson junction, where the charging energy can be seen as a capacitance. And the cross that you see here is just uh, the element that represents the Joyson energy part of the circuit. Okay, so uh, now that we uh, have our two energy scale, um, we can write down the Hamilton of such a junction. And so there is the two parts that I described. The first one will be the charging energy that depends on the square of the uh, charge difference between the two elements. And um, the second one will be the Joyce energy that depends on the cosine of the superconducting phase difference. So how can we understand such Hamiltonian? Actually, what you can see here is that um, the first part that is quadratic in uh, the variable can be seen as, actually, as a kinetic energy. And so it means that the second part can also be seen as a potential energy where the potential would be a cosine potential. And so therefore, uh, the wave function of, your, uh, of this Hamiltonian will be the following. So you will have a particle that will be trapped in the periodic potential. And uh, the spreading of the wave function will depend on the ratio of your two energy scale. You can understand that if the just energy is very small, the wave function will broaden. And if, at the contrary, the charging energy is uh, very small, it means that it has very small kinetic energy, so it remains at the bottom of your uh, potential. So it's very convenient because it means that actually this Joyson junction can be seen as a particle trapped in the periodic potential, and whose parameter can be tuned just by tuning the parameter for Joyson junction. So um, just like to understand what are the different kind of regimes that you can reach, uh, let's say that you're in a regime where the Joyce energy is way larger than the charging energy, then you have a very high potential and a very heavy particle. So it means that the particle will remain trapped at the bottom of your potential, and so that therefore you can forget about the nonlinearity of your potential, so that it's quadratic. And so therefore, what you have is not a very, uh, it's not a Joyson junction really, but it's more of a LC circuit because it's a quadratic company. So it's very convenient because it means that you can go from the impurity regime where you are trapped in a cosine potential to a very simple LC circuit. So that's the key element that we're going to use. Uh, to implement our problem. So this is how we implement our impurity, and just to be sure that we are on board, like the stuff that we are going to measure is not the normalization of the barrier, but the normalization of the just energy, because that's uh, what's the barrier for our uh, effective particle. 
Okay, so that's was for the impurity, and now we need to couple it to an environment. So what's very convenient with circuit is that an environment can be seen as a resistance. So we could think about just hooking up this resistance to our Jackson junction and see how these two uh, things are interacting together. But we, sh we choose a, a quite different approach that is not to use just a bulk piece of metal, but we, uh, to use a transmission line. Uh, and so it means that I have to convince you know that the uh, transmission line is actually the same as uh, resistance, um, which is not straightforward because you see that the transmission line is made out of a purely non dissipative element. So you could expect that these things will not dissipate any energy. But the trick here is to say, like, let's say my transmission line is infinite. And then uh, I send an excitation at the input of the transmission line. So it will propagate in the transmission line. And because it's infinite, it will never come back. Or if it's long enough, it will come back in long enough time so that you don't have to consider that. So it means that if you are able to design very long transmission line, you can see them as a dissipative environment or as a mask. So what kind of uh, impedance can you reach uh, by using such kind of transmission line? Uh, you might know that the impedance of such a transmission line is given by this uh, quite simple formula, where L is the inductance per side or the inductance per length, and uh, Cj is uh, the, the capacitance per length. So if you do a bit of uh, calculation, uh, the impedance that you'll be able to reach is actually on the order of few hundreds of ohm at, at max, and it's actually very far from uh, what is called the quantum of impedance. Uh, but why should we care? Uh, actually, we should care because in this circuit, uh, the alpha, so the dissipation induced by your system, is actually given by the ratio of these two impedance. So it means that if you want to have a system where alpha is close to one, so if you want to be close to the quantum phase transition, you need to be able to design an I mean, transmission line whose impedance will be close to the quantum of impedance. So that's uh, the first thing we need to, the second thing that we need to implement. And actually, uh, as you could have guessed from the data, what we are going to do is once again to use the injunctions, but then we put them in series. So you see that all the, the, the box are basically just injunctions that we put in series. And basically, uh, we saw that if we are using this just injunction in the so called linear regime, then they will, uh, so EJ way larger than EC. Then they will behave as LC oscillators. And so you will end up with this effective surface. So it's not exactly the one of the transmission line that I've shown you before, but it's close enough so that you can uh, use it as it was the transmission line. So, and why using arrays of junction junction is interesting is because uh, the inductance of such junction are order of magnitude larger than the, the geometrical one you will get with, uh, using normal metals. And because the impedance depends on the square root of this inductance, it means that you will be able to implement way larger uh, impedance using such chains of junction. Okay, so that's how we aim, like, that's how we are going to simulate our boundary uh, and problem. So now I'm going to show you how do we characterize our environments. Uh, so these are like some uh, chips that I designed to make easy. So these are like basically like one by one uh, centimeter uh, chips. And you can see that in the middle there is some diffraction pattern. And basically these things, if you zoom out or if you're using a pure SCM, uh, you will see that there is uh, these things that are basically uh, the, the area of Jackson junction that uh, I introduced before, where any of the vertical line is actually a Jackson junction. So uh, the typical number of junctions that we can uh, stack on one chip uh, without too much of an effort is uh, around 10 to the 5 junctions per chip. So it means that these junctions are long enough so that the completion line will be long enough and will actually act as a dispatch program. So this is how we design them. Uh, then maybe very briefly, how do we measure them? Uh, actually, because the typical frequencies of our system uh, are in the gigahertz range, it means that if you want the system not to be poised by thermal excitation, you need to go to temperatures that are in the tens of millikelvin range. And because of that, it means that you need to use a, what's called a dissolution fridge. And this is just a picture of uh, such a dissolution fridge. I mean, one of the fridge I use during my PhD. And um, a few other challenges, uh, 
because you want to measure an environment, it means that you need to be able to measure this environment across all of its bandwidth. So it means that you need to be able to filter every kind of noise across a very large bandwidth. And also, uh, things that were tricky is that you need to actually be able to measure the single photon region. And the reason why is that uh, you want to probe the characteristic of your system, but you don't want to disturb it too much because if you want to measure like uh, equilibrium property, you should not like put your system too far from its equilibrium. So it means that you need to build the single photon regime, so you need to measure a very small uh, signal. And of course, uh, you need to be able to fabricate the very long chains of function. That was quite a uh, trick. Okay, so with that being known, uh, actually, how do we measure our chains of junction? Um, I mean, it's actually, I mean, the schematic is actually quite simple. Uh, you just hook him up, hook him up to two uh, commercial uh, coaxial tables, lithium uh, coaxial tables. And so then what you will do is that you will send some uh, incoming microwave photon at the input of your system, and you will look at what's going outside of the circuit. And so by doing so, you are actually measuring what's called the transmission of your setup. And so now, uh, if you measure this transmission as a function of the frequency, so you buy the frequency of your incoming signal, then what you measure is the following arrays of this. So how can we understand that? Um, so I told you that these chains of junction are supposed to be very high impedance. I mean, like, at least that's what we hope. And they are actually linked to something that is 50 ohm, so a quite low impedance. So it means that uh, there is a very strong mismatch in impedance between these two things. And because of that, uh, what will happen is that there will be some standing wave for me in your medium. And uh, basically, the dips, I mean, you can, you can prove that the dips that you measure are actually corresponding to the resonance frequency of this uh, standing wave. So it's quite nice because it means that by measuring this transmission uh, measurement, you can actually report all of the resonance mode of your system. And so now the way we characterize our circuit is that we report all of the resonance mode that we can measure uh, as a function of their mode index. So if we do so uh, across the measurement bandwidth that we have, which is like from 0.5 GHz to, uh, let's say, 15 yeah. So you will report all of these dots that, that correspond to the horizons that we are able to measure. And so now, uh, what this is, actually, it's what's called the dispersion relation of your media. It's the link between the wave uh, vector and the, the frequency of uh, the wave, of the wave propagating in it. So uh, how can we use this dispersion relation in order to uh, extract useful information? Uh, basically, we have to go back to the circuit uh, of this uh, medium. And what's happening is that there is two regions. If you're at very low frequency, you see that the dispersion relation is almost linear. And it's simply because if you're at very low frequency, basically, you can neglect the capacitance that is in parallel to the inductance. And therefore, you recover the ideal transmission line, the textbook, the textbook swan. And you, you might know that for this kind of transmission line, uh, the discussion relation is supposed to be linear. So this is what we see here. But you can imagine that when the, the frequency will increase, then the capacitance will start to play a role, and then the discussion relation will start to bend until you reach a cutoff that will be given by the set uh, frequencies of this reasonable. So this is how we understand the discussion relation, and actually we can fit it using this circuit model. And this will be used in order to uh, actually extract the impedance of the medium. So for the chain of junction that we measured here, it was an impedance which was around two kilo. So knowing that the quantum of impedance is around five, uh, six kilo ohm in superconductor, it means that the alpha value that we have is around 0.3. So it's not one, but it's in the order of one. So it's close enough so that we can start to probe like some uh, interesting physics close to the quantum phase transition. Okay, so we have our uh, highly dispersed medium, and now we need to, I mean, we try to see if we can actually measure some uh, von Neyes and Gordon physics. And to do so, we just slightly change the previous circuit by adding uh, the red element that you see here, that is basically a uh, squid. So you don't really need to understand what's a squid, but at the end of the day, it's just like a loop uh, implemented by two Jackson junctions. And uh, you can, and by using so, you can actually see it as a Jackson junction whose uh, Jackson energy 
is flux readable. So by applying a flux in my in the loop formed by this two uh, jun JSON junction, I will be able to uh, institute two the JSON energy. So it means that I, I can actually prop the von Weiss and Gordon uh, physics of my problem for different JSON energy in my circuit just by applying magic flux. So that's one of the tricks that we're going to use. Uh, so these are like some SL pictures of the sample. And so now that we know how to actually implement our system, we try to measure, uh, I mean, we will try to measure the organization of the impurity that I described in the introduction. So to do so, once again, we are going to do a transmission measurement. So, and what we end up with is this arrays of uh, bits. And so, Basically, what we are going to do is once again to report what are the frequency of this present mode. Uh, but because we have an extra mode, an extra knob, sorry, which is the uh, just energy of the impurity, so we can tune it actually in situ, and so we can report the frequency of the mode for different just energy in the impurity. So by doing so, you will uh, end up with the following kind of spectrum, where basically every blue dot is one of the resonances that. Uh, that we could resolve in our set as a function of the plus in the in the suite. So I will spare you the the complete procedure on how do we go from this spectrum to the run rate of energy, but just to to go to the to, to just as the, we can go to the main results, which is that uh, so using this spectrum we could actually measure uh, the run rate of energy. As a function of the bare one, so the one that we, that we will we will have without any organization. And so, as a guide to the eyes, what you can uh, actually report is uh, what would happen if there would be no organization. So that's the dash line. And so you can see that. So it's a log log scale. And so you can see that uh, at uh, very large S energy, so when the component is very strong, uh, there is almost no organization. So the two almost overlap. And when you go to lower and lower just energy, the phase fluctuations start to completely uh, and to increase a lot by order of magnitude. And so you, you, you see that the organization will start will also increase. And actually, we can um, reproduce quite nice, I would say, on the decay. I mean, we, we can quite well understand what's happening for the high uh, just an energy uh, regime. Uh, by using uh, the formula that I'm showing you here, uh, that have been actually implemented in these papers. And so I would say like the, the take home message of this is that um, we can actually uh, implement a boundary single problem uh, where we are actually quite close to the localized localized space condition because uh, the polarization is on 0.3 to the bare value. So it's not going to zero, but it's like a sizable uh, fraction of it. And so we think that because of that, uh, using such a of junction junction is actually a good way to prove this localized space condition. And so with that, I think I'm going to conclude. Um, so in the first part, I've explained you how we actually use Jackson junction arrays to engineer a strong dispersive medium. And then I, I've shown you that because of that, we can actually measure some uh, physics that is related to the bond ice and the problem in the non perturbative way. So with that, I'm done, and if you have questions, I'll take questions. Thank you. 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 What the real dissipation is different from just like a quantum zero effect. And if you want to that's a different particle and just keep measuring it, it'll stay in the same. Um, yeah, I guess it's like somehow. I mean, if you. Yeah, I guess it's somewhat related because, like, if you have like strong discussion, it's as if the environment will measure more and more the particle. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's related, but I don't know exactly if I. Yeah, I guess it's related, but I don't know exactly if I. Yeah, I guess it's related, but I don't know exactly if I. 
I mean, how much? Yes, what are, what are the future interventions? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we say like, uh, I mean, actually, it's like part of things that we've done. Uh, and uh, we try, I mean, this was like the signature saying that, okay, you can use this platform to develop engineer like the system that we want. Uh, but these have been, I mean, so more measured in like different ways using different platforms. But there is some stuff that was never really properly measured. That was actually that uh, the impurity itself is inducing dissipation within the bus, which is like the counterpart of this effect. And so by using uh, this array of function, because we can actually monitor it by just probing the modes, um, we, we, we can actually monitor this dissipation. That is uh, the counterpart. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, and also, actually, once you have like this ID space or run you can use it to implement different kind of uh, quantum inequality problem, like uh, a spin boson system, or like there's different kind of platform that are actually close to this problem that you would like to engineer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good luck. Uh, let's thank the speaker once again.